Well, good evening, everybody. We're glad you were with us. Yeah, Don, I'm glad you got your notes from last week. Welcome, everybody, online. My name is Sean. I'm the pastor of the church. And uh, it's an honor to have you looking in for our people online. And it's good to have the people here tonight. Thank you. It's been a rather hot day here in Metro Nashville. I checked um, the thermometer uh, right about 7 o'clock. It was still 90 degrees outside. So it's still kind of stoking. Yeah. Don, you got your jacket on tonight, right? <laughs> well, anyway, uh, it's good to have you, and I hope you're here, and I hope that this is uh, going to be a good time for you. This uh, two-part message series uh, has been So You Want to Grow, and unfortunately, last week we had some technical difficulties with our video. I think you were able to listen online, but uh, I think because of that, you weren't able to see you know, this, uh, this board Maybe just let me go over last week, and uh, I tell you what, let's just start with the reading of, uh, of Scripture so we get a little context here, and then I'll break down just a little bit of last week and then go into this week. Is that okay with you all? Uh, we're looking at the passage from Second Peter. Uh, Peter wrote two books that we have in, towards the end of Scripture, first and second Peter, and we're going to be in the second of those letters and each book in the Bible is broken down into chapters, and we're going to be in the first chapter, and we're going to take a look at uh, verses 2 and following. And uh, Peter says this, and I want you to understand this again. I'm going to drill this into our minds because I need to be reminded of it, and I hope everybody here and online does as well. God's grace precedes anything we do. God's grace is the genius of and the impetus for everything we do in the Christian life. You don't earn anything. Peter says, grace and peace be yours in abundance. You know, just as much as we need, God's grace is abundant to us through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And then he says, God's divine power has given us everything we need for a life of godliness through our knowledge of him, see he keeps using knowledge. I'm going to get there and just uh, at the end of the message tonight. Through these great promises, verse 4, that we can have this assurance that through them you may participate in the divine nature. And Peter wants us to understand, and Scripture does as well, that the Christian faith is not a set of beliefs. It's not just believe in certain things to kind of get into the church in the right way or so you can believe the certain things so you can go home and have some sense of, okay, I got basic knowledge down. No, we participate. Jesus pursued us and made us new. And because of that, we are now given his nature and his power within us. That's why Peter says we can participate in the nature of God. Why? Because Jesus lives his life through us. That's the very heart of the Christian faith. We okay with that? And we need to be reminded of that over and over and over and over and over again. So then he goes on, verse 5, and he says, For this very reason, make every effort. And I'll just share this again. God is not opposed. Dallas Willard used to say this to us all the time. He's not opposed to effort. He's opposed to earning. You can never earn anything. But if, God, if what God is going to do in your life is going to take some effort, he can't overcome a sense of which we're just lazy or we're just passive or we just believe, well, God's going to have to do it for me because I never want to earn anything. You're not earning anything. But Peter here says, make every effort. Make every effort to have these dimensions of growth in your life. So this is where we picked up last week. And he lists eight different dimensions or graces, if you will, and we picked off four of them last week, and we're going to pick off another four this week so we can kind of get an idea of what Peter is saying here. He says, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness. So faith, let me just share what I said last week real quick. Faith is basically trust. Uh, biblical faith isn't just having knowledge in your head. It's getting to the point where you trust enough to give yourself to that. So if I want to trust that chair, I can say it's a beautiful chair, but until I go over and put my weight in it and trust it, I don't really believe in the chair. Same thing with Jesus. I can have faith in Jesus. That's, you know, I, okay, he, he lived, 
but do I really believe him enough and trust him enough to give him my life? Because he knows my life better than I know my own. He can make my life what he wants it to be, and I trust him with that. So faith is trust. And he says, add to your faith, he says, add to your faith goodness. And that basically is virtue. And the way that we find virtue is training ourselves. We just don't try, we train. We, we begin certain things to help us to grow in our life. We begin to do things in small increments. And uh, if I want to learn how to play the piano over here, I, I can't just go over there and start playing the piano. I have to go, go back to the old books, I forget what they're called, and begin your scales and begin to learn how to play the piano. That's the same way in the Christian life. We train, we just can't try. We need to train, and that's what Peter says. Add to your faith goodness, and then goodness, knowledge. Knowledge is understanding. It's not knowing facts. It's through our understanding, coming to understand the realities of life, namely that God is true, and that his Son reveals him to us, and that through that truth, we can know what reality is all about. So knowledge, and then we come to the last of what we talked about last week, and that is self-control. Self-control is basically self-government. That's what that word actually means. It's the whole sense of sticking to something, that sense of you're not just working on impulse anymore. You're, you're intentional about the direction of your life. It is disciplining yourself in the way of Jesus. So those are the four things we talked about last week. And I said to the people last week, we're going to pick off the remaining four tonight. So let's do that, and then I'll conclude. Is that okay? You guys have any questions so far for those of you who are here? Any questions about what those different graces, if you will, or growth marks in your life? Uh, anything that you would like to share about that? Anything that you would say, this, really, this one really hit me? whether it be faith itself or, you know, goodness, anything along those lines, that you knowledge, self-control, anything that just really hits at you? If not, and tell, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, there are people that are here. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions online, you just chime in. If you want to tell me that you're here, check in, get on board tonight. Let me know you're with us. Be glad to do that, okay? Glad to have you with us. Here we go. Off of self-control, the fifth dimension of grace, if you will, or growth, is perseverance. Uh, perseverance is that sense of endurance, and I think that's what we need to get to. It kind of goes along with self-control. That sense we, are, we stick to something. We are willing through God's grace to get up and continue have you found that much of life is just showing up? I think that's true. I think we learn much about life by just showing up. And we may not be going as fast as we want to. We may be more the tortoise than the hare. But I think much of life is just persevering through the things that we're going through. Anybody want to share anything with that? Notice how self-control and perseverance, the fourth Grace and the fifth grace kind of go together. Self-control and perseverance kind of are, are coupled together because they go together. Take a look if we can tonight, and I just think this, maybe some of you even did this in your own mind, but go back a couple uh, chapters, if you will, or chapters, a couple books, to uh, the book of James. Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, and then James. So it's just right before this a little bit. James is the earthly brother uh, of, of our Lord. Uh, he was not, didn't believe in his brother at all until he saw him resurrected. Then he became a church leader. And he writes this book of very much practical application of the Christian faith. And in the first chapter of James, chapter 3, well, let's go to chapter 2. We'll get to, uh, I'm sorry. We're going to be in chapter 1. Let's start off with verse 2, okay? And then we'll get to verse 3. I want us to get to verse 3, but let's get a little context. He says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. I'm not there yet. P 
Pure joy is an ecstasy. It's not a sense in which you're just happy to go through trials. But if, you, if, if God has allowed something into your life, it serves a good purpose, a redeeming purpose. And James says you can be joyful in the fact that if it's in your life, God is aware of it, and he will use it for good. Not that it's good that you're going through something, but he'll use it for good. So James says consider it joy when you go through trials of many kinds. Verse 3, and this is what I want to get to, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature. See, perseverance is a, is a maturing element. It is a growing element in the life of a follower of Jesus. It is one that says, I'm going through with Jesus. I'd rather go through trials with Jesus than not having trials without Jesus. Because Jesus is it for me. He's it for me. And I'm going to persevere with him. And I just want to share, uh, I think I'm preaching to the choir here tonight, these people, but if it's... Uh, if it's uh, relevant for you, take it as such. And if you're online and you're looking at your life and you're saying, man, I can, I don't know, the last couple of days, the last couple of weeks, uh, you feel in the time period, but Sean, I have felt so low and discouraged and dejected. And if you really want to know the truth, Sean, I have felt defeated. I've let myself down. I've left my own sense of what I know God would be pleased with in my life. I've just kind of jacked things up in my life. And you are like low as low can be. I just want to tell you, don't give up. Because God is doing something in and through you, and he's developing perseverance in your life. And when that begins to take hold, that is what gives us strength to go forward and never turn back. We all have sung that, haven't we? I have decided, right, to follow Jesus. No turning back. I'm persevering. Paul says this to Timothy, doesn't he? He said, I've fought the good fight. He said, I've, I've finished my race because he had endurance to follow through with Jesus. And I just want to share that with you tonight, that James says perseverance has a work within us. And as we mature, we get to the point where we really understand that God is with us in the highs and lows and really when we're very, very low. Have you ever experienced those very low points in your life? I mean, we oftentimes don't come to church and want to talk about the lows of life. But I think that's the reality of life. Even the most saintly person can go through times of despair and a sense it's not true but their feelings tell them they're defeated, they're discouraged, and we have to support people because you know what's going to happen? It's not going to be them one day. Guess who it's going to be? You and me. And James tells us that we should and can persevere, and Peter says the same thing to us. Turn back, if you want, to Second Peter now. Uh, but he says, you know, Make every effort to be growing in your perseverance. Let me just share with you. You know this. I shared this is one of my favorite verses. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 29. I'm just picking up the very end of this passage, but I think you know it. God gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youth. That's kind of a weird word, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know why he didn't say even young people, but... Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men and women stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. So that's where endurance comes from. You just you have this stick to about you that says, I feel as low as I can be, but you know what? God has not given up on me, and I'm not going to give up, and I'm going to hope in the Lord. And when you do, the Lord will renew your strength. People that have perseverance will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Amen to that? And I hope tonight that as you're living, you're coming to grips with that sense, God hasn't given up on me and he will not. And as bad as I may feel, I need to sit still for a moment and say, be still 
and know that he's still God and he's with me. And as bad as it may be, as bad as you may feel about yourself, just say, Lord, I'm not turning back. I'm with you. I'm with you. Aren't you thankful for that? Have you showed up some mornings and you're saying to yourself, I feel like the worst <laughs> or I feel so low. And then all of a sudden you hear the words of grace and people encouraging you and you're saying, I can do this. I can, I can make it. I, I now see a new way that God is with me. Anybody want to share with that? Anybody online want to share what those words, uh, that verse means to you? I, I, I want to give time for expression to that. Anybody? Okay, so perseverance, next, godliness. And oftentimes this is, I think, a little bit confused because then we, people, particularly within our denomination, that look to and want to live a holy life and say, see, here, here God's calling us to, uh, to godliness again. Well, he is, but more particularly, the word that's used deals more with revering. Uh, it, it deals with respecting it deals with coming to understand the goodness and the faithfulness and the love and the holiness of God. See, over and over again in the Psalms, um, this is said. If you want to turn real quickly, I had Stacy put this up. Stacy, did you get up on the screen for people at home? Okay, good. Look at, uh, okay, if you just want to look at it, um, you know, here in the, in the sanctuary on our um, know, on our, on our boards, you can surely do that. But many of the Psalms have this component to it where they, they look at and they understand the goodness of God. And they talk about how the Lord's love lasts forever and how his faithfulness is from generation to generation. And that, that is a sense in which they have come to understand that's what the whole idea of godliness deals with. It is focusing your attention on the goodness of God and worshiping God in your life. Uh, it is revering and respecting him. Psalm 136, turn there if you can. It's, um, it's kind of one of those, for most of us, we say, you know, these people just don't get it. They have to say it. I think it's 26 times if you want to name them off. But it says, uh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. And then this phrase is repeated, his love endures forever. And, and they do that 26 times. And you're thinking to yourself, well, why do you have to repeat this? We get it the first time. That God's good and his love, and, okay? No, see, that's what happens. When you come to this point in your life where you say, I'm growing in my godliness, you're focusing your attentions on who God is and not yourself. And you're beginning to worship him in deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper ways. And you come to the point when you just say to yourself, Lord, when I consider all these different ways, Lord, your love endures forever. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Give thanks to the Lord. Can you imagine? See, this is what they call an antiph uh, antiphonal reading where maybe the, 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 um, in the Old Testament, it probably was a priest who would get up in the synagogue and he would start off and say, give thanks to the Lord for he is good and the congregation would respond, what? His love endures forever. And then the, you know, the leader would say it again. And it was this antiphonal or back and forth. One would say one thing and then others would respond. And there's that sense of which, do you really need to repeat it that much? Well, sometimes repeating something is good. My kids, uh, you know, they're, they, love, uh, they love music and they, they love some Christian music. But they say, Dad. Dad, sometimes Christian music is just nothing but three or four chords, and they repeat the same stuff over and over again. Dad, come on. And I'm like, well, hold on now. I can, I can turn to some pretty classic rock and roll music or some modern-day music, and they do the same thing. But the point, deeper point is the people of God say, as you recall and as you recall and as you say over and over again, you begin to see greater applications of how God is good and his love endures forever. And that's what these people are doing. They're thinking about all the ways now that they're reverencing and respecting and loving who God is in their life. 
And I would just say to us, as you grow in your grace and as you grow in your walking with Jesus, you'll find more and more ways that you can thank God for his goodness in your life. You have a greater sensitivity to the goodness of God in your life. I'm, I'm still learning. I'm still learning. Uh, I have a, a three-month-old grandson, and uh, last week he was sick. And, uh, you know, he had kind of like this head cold where he had junk coming out of his nose and coughing up junk out of his mouth. And I was concerned about it, you know, because he started to get a little fever. And uh, I called the next day, hey, how's Cash you're doing? And my daughter-in-law says, you know what, he's doing much better. He feels much better. And I went through that day for about three or four hours, and then it hit me. It hit me. Sean, you just missed a moment to thank God for who he is, that his love endures and he's good. Amen to that? Think of the ways in your life that you can say, Lord, you're good. You're good. And I, want to, I just want to worship you and want to revere you and tell to you, as the psalmist said, give thanks to the Lord. For he is good. Amen to that? Anybody want to share anything? Let's live in a life of worship. Remember how uh, probably been 20, 25 years ago, Matt Redman wrote a, I think it's going to, it's one of those, you know, songs that will last forever, Heart of Worship. I'm coming back to a heart of worship, and it's all about you, Jesus. That's what godliness in this sense means. It means having a life whereby you're, you adore and you worship, and you do that in a sense of worshiping in all that you say or do. Paul brings us up oftentimes, in word or deed, do all in thanksgiving to the Lord. That sense of living a worshipful life. Anybody? Anybody online? Okay, perseverance, godliness, and now we get down to this point of two types of love. All these things build towards, as you grow in Jesus, all of what you're doing is building towards love. What does Paul say? I can speak, I can preach, I can sing, I can give everything I have to the poor, I can actually even give my body, right? But if I have not what? Love, I'm nothing. Everything builds towards your life and mine, and if you're at home, you're saying, what's the goal of the Christian life? It is to be a person who exemplifies the love of Jesus in your life. People came to Jesus and said, Jesus, out of all this over 600 rules and regulations we have in and around the Ten Commandments, what's the greatest one? And he knew what they were trying to do. He, they, they were trying to put him into a corner, and Jesus, what's he say? He says, love God with all your being and love your neighbor as yourself. Because everything in the law was, see, they they got this confused, but everything in the law was to bring them to a love and devotion towards God and a love and devotion towards the people in their life. They, They got it all wrong. They made it a law unto itself, divorced from any sense of love towards God and other people. And Jesus says, you want to know? You want to really want to know what all those laws you've made? It's about loving God and loving people. And he saw through all their laws and all their motivations, and he understood they were religious people, but they were bankrupt in love. I don't want you as your pastor to be bankrupt in love. And I don't want that for you if you're watching at home. I think at the very heart of what it means to be a Christian, like Peter is saying right here, all these things, any knowledge you have of Jesus, any faith that you have in him, any sense of understanding, any sense of self-control, any sense of perseverance, any sense of worship in your life, it's all building towards a sense of which, Lord, I want to be consumed by your love, and I want to be able to love people in my life in a way that you have. I'm never going to be perfect in it. I'm going to stumble and bumble And I'm learning how to love you and love other people. But that's the goal of my life. I want to know you, Jesus, so that as I know you, I can love you. And as I love you, your love is going to help me do what you want me to do. And that's to love people. So the first one here is Philadelphia. (laughs) That's actually the word. It's a brotherly, sisterly, 
kind of a love. It's a, a love in general. It's a love that, you know, when you have a sense of love and worship towards God, as we've just gone over here, then you have a basic sense of general goodwill towards the people of your life. That's the reason why it's oftentimes used among families, that families just naturally have this towards one another. Well, it's the same way with you and me, that we have a, as we're growing in God's love, we begin to see and want general goodwill for the people of our life. Look, uh, I, I think that's good enough. I think, so this deals with, do your translations have kindness or does it have love? What do you have up here? Uh, uh, let's go back to Second uh, Peter, uh, if we can, uh, in uh, chapter 2. Uh, my uh, translation, which is the U- uh, New International Version, says, uh, and to godliness, brotherly kindness. Do you have that same thing, or do you have, what do you have there for yourself? Kindness, there you go. There you go. So it, it deals with that whole sense of, of love, generally speaking, a sense of goodwill for people. But then as we progress and grow, our sense of brotherly kindness or sisterly kindness comes to this point at the, at the core or at the summit, if you will, is this sense of love. It's not just any general sense of I'm in love with love like our world does, right? I mean, this emotion that I'm just consumed by a love of love. I just love, you know, and we kind of want to, oh, that's a warm fuzzy, isn't it? And, you know, couples nowadays do the same thing. I'm just in love with you. Uh, but what happens when I don't feel like I'm in love anymore? You know what they do? They think they've made a mistake and they're going to go out and do it again. Some, you know, that's not the love I'm talking about. This type of love is a Christ-like love. It's a love in particular. It is a sacrificial type of love. And that's what Peter is wanting us to understand, that through all these, they're all building in us a sense in which we can experience agape love from Jesus. I'm going to share in just a second, so hold on while that means. And then I'm able in greater and greater measures to share a sacrificial, loving commitment to the good of other people. I'm willing to sacrifice for the love that I have for other people. So one of the hallmark texts, uh, just turn back um, a couple books. Actually, don't turn back. Uh, continue towards the end of Scripture. Go through Second Peter. Go uh, one book towards the end of Scripture, and you'll come to the book of First John. And I just want to look at this uh, real quickly because this is, this is at the heart of what it means to have agape love. Um, I don't have time, and I don't even want to go in and through this because this is not something that we need to keep in mind. But the word agape is a Greek word that was used well before the Christians started to use it. It was in Greek philosophy, but it was never used in this particular way. It was, uh, it was used in a sense of which we love people for a sense of the virtue in it or what that other person does for us or the benefit that it gives to both of us, but never in the sense in which love was to be self-giving. Remember how Paul talks about, this is how God showed his love among us, that although he was equal with God, he gave himself away, even become like a servant, dying on a cross. That type of sacrificial, self-emptying love was never known before Jesus and his followers picked this word agape up, because that's what, Peter and all the writers of Scripture, this love is not a uh, leveraging type love. It's not a selfish type love. It's not having friendships because they give you something in return. No, 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 no. Jesus loved us just because. Matter of fact, he loved us when we weren't even lovable. And he says, be that way with other people. Even when they don't deserve it, love them. Even when they've royally screwed up, love them. Even when your opinions and You know, viewpoints are totally diametrically opposed. Love them nonetheless. Why? Because that's the way I've loved you. And as you grow in grace, you will come to the point where you say, I don't love somebody because I agree with them. I love them because I know that's what they need because I surely need it. And thankfully, Jesus gives it to me. Amen to that? You you okay with that? I'm still working towards that in my life. But that is the goal 
of the Christian's life. First John. John uh, wrote this. He also wrote the Gospel of John. He writes three short letters here, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. He writes the book of Revelation. He really understood and really looked at Jesus' life. And look what he says here in chapter 4, and he says this in verse 9. So this, again, is 1st John, and this is chapter 4, and this is verse 9. And he goes right to the heart. He says, this is how God showed his agape love among us. Every occurrence of love in this passage is agape. You look in the Greek text, and it's, agape, it's different forms of the noun or the verb of agape, okay? That type of sacrificial, self-emptying love. This is how God first showed his agape love for us. He sent his one and only son into the world. This is, so, this is like the heart of the gospel right here. Can you say it with me? If you're at home, just say it into your computer screen. For those of us that are here tonight, say this with me. It's up on the screen. Uh, say it with me. Start at he. He sent his one and only son into the world that we may live through him. That's the gospel. That is the gospel. It is him giving us life. There are groups, oh, no, 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 no. Gospel is just our forgiveness because that's what bars us from heaven. The reality is God wants to give us life, not just forgiveness. Jesus said it, I'm life. John says that we may have life through him. Verse 10, this is love. This is agape love. Not that we agape loved God, but that he, <laughs> you understand my point? Just consider, I'm not going to, as that sounds so stupid, but it's self-emptying. Let me put it that way. But that he self-emptied himself and loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Amen to that? That's it. Dear friends, and this word right there, this noun is plural, and it talks about that whole sense, agape toy. It's, it's plural. It's a, it's a noun that talks about beloved. Do you have in your translations, do your translations have dear friends, or does it have the word beloved? Friends, put beloved in there. That's a better translation. Now, nothing wrong with friends because Jesus calls us friends. But in this context, I think it's better to say dearly beloved because that's who we are in Jesus, agape toy. We are dearly loved. You all, it's a plural. You all are dearly loved. You're beloved. Beloved, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we sacrificially agape love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. We know that we live in him and he in us because, and say this with me, because he has given us of his spirit. See how it all ties back? We can't do this ourselves. Peter says the same thing. Grace and abundance, I'm sorry, grace I just forgot what he said. What did he say? Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Why? How? Because we're partaking of the very nature of God through his spirit. John, the biblical writers, although they write in different ways, have much that just kind of weaves a common thread to their understanding about Jesus. And this is one. We don't live the Christian life ourselves. We live it because Jesus lives in us. That's the only way that we can love people with a self-emptying, self-sacrificing way. Jesus gives us the strength to do it in our life. Anybody want to share anything with that? Do you all fall short of this? <laughs> that sounds kind of self-defeating. I don't mean it that way, but I think when you put Jesus in front of you, all of us have room to grow in this, don't we? We all have room to grow and say, Lord, I want to love like you do. And I want you to continue to help me to grow in my life so that I can really see people not to be used, not to be leveraged, but to be loved because you love them just as you love me. So, Jesus, you're living your life through oh me. You're living your life through me, so I want you to help me through your spirit to love the people of my life. 
that's, that's really a, a very needed thing for us to consider. All this that we've gone through, all these different dimensions of growing in Jesus, all wind up down here with a love that is not self-centered, it's not self-seeking, it is self-emptying. It is giving ourselves away because that's exactly the kind of love Jesus gave to us. What do you think? Help me here. Anybody want to share anything with that? That's not easy. I, I don't think this is meant to be easy. But the best things in life aren't easy. And when you begin to see evidences of a growth in the love of Jesus in your life, there's a great sense of purpose and a great sense of, oh, I don't know how to say it, a great sense of joy that you're beginning to understand what life is all about. We okay? Anybody want to share anything? Any response? Any life experience? Anything that hits with you in this regard? Okay, let's wrap up this So You Want to Grow, this two-part lesson by looking at this at the very uh, heart of what this passage is all about. Two things to consider, and I want to turn back to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 8, okay? And Peter says, For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, if you, another way to see this, if you, possess these qualities, the word increasing can also be abundance or abounding. So if you possess these measures in abounding measure, they will keep you from being effective and unproductive. So let's just state it in the positive. Uh, two things I want to share with you. First of all, notice how the word knowledge is used, I think, at my last count, four times in these seven or eight verses. Knowledge or understanding uh, is so important in following Jesus. Um, that's the reason why Paul always talks about keeping Jesus before us. Uh, set your mind on things above. Let Jesus reign in your mind. Uh, keep Jesus before you because having that interactive dependency upon Jesus, knowing not just knowing, but understanding Jesus is uh, a foundational point for having growth in him. That's very important. And then secondly, uh, that phrase increasing measure or abounding, in, uh, abounding abundance in measure, if you will. This phrase describes discipleship. You may say, Pastor, what does discipleship mean? It means to follow to become a student or an apprentice of Jesus, and you are learning how in increasing measure to be like Jesus. That's what discipleship is all about. And unfortunately, sadly to say this, many churches today think discipleship is optional for your life. Pray a prayer. Make sure you're going to heaven when you die. But that's about all they tell you to do. And then just rely upon and trust in and find God's forgiveness and just live your life. Nothing could be further from the truth. That, that's what it means to be a disciple. You are experiencing a greater measure of these graces in your life. And I just want to leave that with you tonight. And as you do, as you grow, Peter says you can be productive you can have effectiveness in your life. You won't go through long periods of stumbling and bumbling and falling. You'll have an experience, an abundant life that will carry you right on through death and into the presence of Jesus. Peter takes a very wide scope of your life and he says, as you're living your life, I don't care how old you are, how young you are, let this be your goal. Make every effort to add these graces in your life. Faith. I mean, all the way through. All these eight. Make it your effort. By God's grace, you're not earning anything. But as you follow Jesus, make every effort to grow in these, nature, in these graces. And you'll begin to see more effectiveness and productivity 
and God will begin to use your life because the reality is the only thing you and I can take with us when we do die is the person we've become. That's the only thing. And I would hope that as you've gone through this for these last two weeks, you see all these Christian graces culminating in a self-emptying love and if it takes you all your life, if it takes me all my life, it's worth it to grow and to deepen our understanding and have a commitment to loving people this way. Because that's what's going to help us. Peter says, if you do all these things, you won't be ineffective or unproductive. And you're going to have an abundant life. And God is going to welcome you into his, what's it say here? Somebody read it for me. I close my Bible. Uh, what's the last verse there? Verse, uh, is it 10? I'll open up my scripture here. Uh, let me just see here. Let's go to, yeah, verse 11. Uh, so this is 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 11. And ye will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Keep that in your head. I don't know what rich means. I don't know if it just means woohoo or we're going to have a bigger party or whatever, but I think Jesus will look into our eyes, and that will be rich enough for him to say to you, well done. Because you know what's going to happen? The person you are now is the person God will use for all eternity. And if we're faithful in the small things now, what does he say? I'll put you in charge of greater things to come. And people say, well, that's, that's just a parable about this life, isn't it? No, it's for all eternity. And, man, when you make it your priority to love and to have a Christ-like, sacrificial, like a rugged commitment to the people of your life, Jesus smiles on you and says, now you're becoming a person that will be richly used in heaven. You're going to receive a rich re a welcome, but then the person you are becoming is the person that I'll use in great ways. And I just want to leave this with you. I mean, this is helpful. Would, could, Jesus, could Jesus use you to govern, I don't know, the United States? Could he be pleased and would he say, you know what? I trust Donna. Donna, go rule over whatever part of God's great universe. She's my type of person. She loves with a self-sacrificing way in their life. And I think that's something we need to keep in our mind. The person we're becoming is what we will take with us into eternity. Nothing else. I, I, would, I guess I would say the person we're becoming and the people we're bringing with us are the only two things that will last into eternity. Donna, go right ahead. What? Are you looking at something? Yeah, yeah. Uh, somebody here, so you don't know, her name is Donna, is asking, this is like scaffolding in our life to help us to grow. Yes. All these eight graces, if you will, are like scaffolding to help us to be the people we want to be and what God wants us to be. So these qualities aren't stagnant. We don't get one, and, you know, and that just, we have to get filled up with that, and then it bleeds down. What You ever seen those like chocolate fountains that, you know, the kind of like areas that, it has to flow over from here down. No. But there is that sense of which there is fluidity between these. Matter of fact, they go up and down. Kindness, godliness helps perseverance. It's the same thing on the first four that we went through. It's just this sense of which they are building on one another and there's fluidity and they help one another, but is building all towards a progression to get to a Christ like love in your life. Are you like making a, a circle kind of a thing? Oh, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's a good way of looking at it. The arrow just kind of, there's no end to these things. Is that what you're trying to say? It just continues and continues, and that's the way. And we're going to grow all the way through heaven. I, I didn't want to spoil your bubble, but this whole idea that we're just going to get some kind of mansion and sit around just like say amen all day long, if that's your idea of heaven, I don't know if that's really really too cool or not. 
Heaven is going to be a place where we're growing and we're maturing and we're learning all the way and we're ruling and reigning with Jesus uh, because his kingdom never ends. His kingdom is never ending. And the sense in which you and I come to this place whereby we're just going to have this stagnant sense. I've actually heard Christians say we're going to live on clouds. I'm like, man, our life is going to be better off than it is now. We will have eternal bodies. And I don't want to get too, like, out there tonight and just leave it hanging. Well, now you've opened up a whole big door, and i got all kinds of questions. I don't want to leave with that. But to say that we are just experiencing what life in its very infancy is all about while we're here on earth. We are looking for and we're becoming apprentices and learning what life is going to be for all eternity. And as Jesus tells us that he wants us to rule with him, why do I say that? Because the original intention of Adam and Eve, you tell me, what's it say? God said to Adam and Eve, rule and reign. That was his desire. Now, that, we have a very hard time with ruling or reigning because people have perverted that into some type of sense of domination, subordination, somebody getting over on somebody less. No, 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 no. It is a sense in which we participate with God in ruling and being good stewards of his creation. Only people that are growing into a life of Christ-like love are able to be that kind of a person that God can say, here's somebody that can rule and reign in the right way. So let's be about that task. It's going to take us all of our life, and we're going to have stumbles, and we're going to have pitfalls, and we're going to have problems. But this can be the overriding desire of our life. This should be the bullseye for our life. Lord, help me to become just like, what does John say? As Jesus has so loved us, what? Dear friends, let us love one another in the same way. i got to learn how to love you, Nita. I mean, you know, we're just learning how to love each other now. But there's that sense in which if I'm going to be the person Jesus wants me to be, by his grace and power, I want to learn how to love all of you in a deeper way. I hope you feel the same way towards the people in this church. And some of you say, well, Sean, I don't even know half of them. That's okay. You're not going to know everybody in this church. But you can, in your relationships naturally with some people, Lord, help me to love this person. Help me to love him or her in ways that it seems so, uh, we seem so far apart. I don't even know who they are. Okay. You've given us this time. Help me to love the people in this church. Help me to love my neighbor. Help me to even know my neighbor's name. Help me to know the person in my cubbyhole at work. We can begin somewhere and begin to say, Lord, help me do all these different things to be a person that really shows a sense of Christ-like love to the people of our life. We go with that? And I pray that for you. I pray that for me. And it's a daunting task if we are left to our own devices, but we're not. Jesus' spirit lives within us to help us to be able to do this. That's the, that's the secret. That is not the secret. That is the hallmark. That is the real foundation. If you want to have good bones in your life, you must ask for and rely and depend upon Jesus' presence and power in your life to do this. You can't do it yourself. But you weren't, you weren't called to do it yourself. Neither was I. Mm -hmm.